Hello, uh, my name is Chris Pollard. I'm a behavioural scientist at Forest Research. And today I'm going to be talking about a bit of work that I've been doing with Mariella Mazzano, a colleague at Forest Research. We've been working on the social dimensions of xylella fastidiosa risk to the UK as part of the Bridget project. So I'm sure many of you will know, but here's a bit of a background on xylella fastidiosa. It's a bacterial disease with over 600 uh, plant hosts. It's transmitted by xylem feeding insect vectors. So as an example there, the meadow spittle bug at the bottom there. Um, but there's many different types of uh, insect vectors, spittle bugs and, and sharpshooters. It can cause uh, leaf scorch, wilt, dieback and, and plant death. That's because the bacteria cause the xylem to, to be um, occluded and blocked. And you can see bottom left there, there's a, an olive tree, a couple of olive trees that have died because of xylella infection. And it's really devastated the, the olive groves in Italy. That's the most famous, most famous examples in Europe. And it's been detected in Italy, in France, Spain and in Portugal, but not currently in the UK. Now, if you want to know a bit more about this, then there's two videos on YouTube which have been um, produced by the Bridget Project, which I'll say a little bit about in a minute. And they're called what is I what is Xylella and where is Xylella? And if you just search that there on YouTube just for a couple of minutes each. So what is the Bridget project? It's set up with uh, its immediate goal to build UK capability to reduce the chance of Xylella being introduced and becoming established in the UK. So it's, it was a big consortium uh, of lots of universities and research organisations with that immediate goal. There's more long term objective, which is more about improving the understanding of how plants respond to infection with insect transmitted plant pathogens and how these symptoms develop. So looking at some of the learning we got from specifically looking at xylella that might be applicable to other pests and diseases in the future. And the way the project was set up was these four distinct work packages. Number one was all about citizen science, outreach, knowledge exchange. Secondly, was enhancing xylella diagnostic capabilities, so concentrating on the pathogen itself. The third one was investigating insect vector biology, so concentrating on those spittle bugs, where they are and how they move potentially in the UK. And the fourth one was epidemiology modelling of xylella spread, so how uh, xylella might spread throughout the country should it ever be introduced or where, where it might be introduced. And that's where we come in. So we were looking at the human pathways of xylella spread. So specifically uh, how the movement of plants is mediated by people and the decisions that they make. So we know the sort of premise in the background to this bit of research is we know, of course, plants move around due to trade in the UK. Um, and sourcing decisions that people make uh, within the trade, they impact where the plants go, of course. And then the plants movements impact these biosecurity risks. So overall, we're saying that the risks of movement and spread of xylella depend on the decisions people are making who take part in the trade. And just the headlines of what we found um, in this bit of work was all about that these sourcing decisions are influenced quite strongly by uh, trust and the trust that people have with who they're working with in the trade. And trust is quite complicated, but we found we could categorise it with the help of some previous research into two different trust types. One that's around quality control. So you trust that you're going to get the quality of um, plants that, you're, that you want. And the second one was trust around close working relationships. So you're, you trust that the person that you're working with is kind of trying to do good by you and trying to have a good relationship. And then we looked at how these different types of trust might um, impact biosecurity risks specifically around xylella fastidiosa with the idea that identifying the this kind of different mix of trust type might allow appropriate risk-based biosecurity interventions so just going back to the beginning who's who's involved in the uk plant trade this is a kind of general stakeholder map of the people and groups who influence and are involved in the uk plant trade our work on plant health at forest research, lots of different projects often involve state stakeholder mapping like this, and we'll put different categorizations and different groups of people based on the research questions we're looking at. For, for this one, this project specifically, I've here highlighted in purple those that we're interested in. So it's those who are directly or very closely related to the buying and selling of plants commercially, i.e. those who make sourcing decisions or have a lot of influence on sourcing decisions. Now thinking about 
evaluating the risk of xylella spread, you can think about studying the flow of plants quantitatively. So you, you could look at the volume of plants moving, the source, the destination, the classification of plants, the species, the, the variety and the prices people are paying. And you can take a paying and you look at all that data. And others have looked at that kind of and are actually continuing to look at those kind of data in order to get an idea of, of risk. And that includes other groups in the Bridget project, specifically FERA. We're looking at that within the Bridget project. But what we're interested in uh, from a behavioural point of view is these behaviours and decision making which kind of drive those quantitative flows. So what what people choosing to do and selecting themselves that can change uh, change these flows and have consequences for biosecurity. Um, we did this by collecting two data sets, um, some in-depth interviews and some uh, what and a more wider reaching questionnaire. It was all these people we talked to and we surveyed were stakeholders in the trade as mentioned on the previous slide with the flowchart and we concentrated on traders in two xylella host species um, that are widely traded in the UK so that's lavender and cherry so one shrub, one shrub and one tree. We talked to tiny businesses up to really large businesses and the interviews we did were all across the UK Whereas the surveys, we decided to uh, concentrate on one specific area in the south of England. So we chose that area because we talked to Bridget modelling colleagues who indicated the south of area, the south of England is an area that's potentially of high risk of xylella due, for, due to climate factors and other things. So we concentrated on talking to people specifically in that area. And we started off by saying about sourcing decisions, OK, why do you use that supplier? And interviewees that we talked to kept mentioning trust. Uh, there's a specific um, example, a landscape contractor saying it's important to have a relationship with your supplier and to trust them. That's the crucial thing to me. And people, was, a few people were saying this, so we thought, okay, but what does actually trust mean in this context? And what impact might it have on biosecurity or potential movement of uh, pests and diseases? So the way we decided to approach this was by using a framework from the literature. So a lot of research has been done on different kinds of trust and how to study it. And we chose one from Das and Teng, they're researchers who concentrate on business and organisational collaboration. So where businesses work together on something, which is, um, <coughs> excuse me, work together on some uh, some kind of objective. And it can include supplier and customer relationships as as I'm using as an example here for a, a, a supplier and a customer of live plants. And looking at trust through this sort of framework can allow us to unpick the why people make certain supplier decisions and the potential implications for biosecurity. So I'm just going to go through this frame for framework quite quickly. This is a very general one and they split the kind of risks of going into a collaboration or working with another business into two. The first one is relational risk. And this is about the probability of non-cooperation. So this is about the risk that the person or business that you're working with hasn't really got your best interests at heart. They're not really working with you. You know, they may be being a bit dodgy or then they're not trying to do the best by you. And the antithesis of this is the is goodwill trust, the trust that you have with another organisation, with a business that they have the intention to perform well. They're trying their best to perform and do the right thing for you and for the relationship. So that's the kind of trust you might build up over time from somebody um, or maybe get recommendations. But if there isn't this trust or the trust is eroded for some way and you still want to maintain this, the, the other way of looking at it is to have a, a some kind of control. So if there's trust not there, there's an action that you can do and they dust and tank all this in control. And in this case, it's interrogation of processes. So if you're not sure that they're doing you right, you can look at the, the processes that they're doing behind the scenes, the way that they work as a business, and you can look into that and interrogate it and say, OK, are they doing the things that I'm expecting them to be doing? Alternatively, there's performance risk, and this is the probability or likelihood of objectives uh, not achieved despite the best effort. So in this case, the, the organisation that you're working with they're trying their best. They do have your best intentions at heart as well. They're working in good faith for the collaboration, but they're just not capable of delivering what they need to or what you want. 
And the kind of antithesis to that is this competence trust, which is the, the performance ability. So you trust that they are able to uh, perform to the level that you want them to and that you've agreed to. But where that doesn't happen, there's this action that you can take, an output control, and that's the measurement and feedback of the output. So that's you would get a product or you would see the output of the relationship. You would scrutinize exactly that output and then feedback to your partner or to your supplier saying this is right or this is wrong. This isn't good enough. This is the problem. So instead of going and looking at the processes they're doing, as in the process control here, you're not really bothered about behind the scenes. You're just telling them I've got detailed information about what's what's arriving or what what is coming out of this relationship and sending it back saying it's satisfactory or not and hope and and they will try and solve that. So that's kind of a bit nebulous general framework, but what about the actual data when we talk to people in the life plan trade? So in our survey we asked can you describe what makes a supplier trustworthy? And these are examples of goodwill trust. So this is the intention to perform that people said good and fair returns policy, being on your side, a willingness to help, being open and honest and shared responsibility. So when we said what's trustworthy, these these are kind of examples that talked about this kind of relationship, this performance intention, people trying to have goodwill. In terms of the interviews, a bit more exam, a few more examples here. Is I sent them an email and within 24 hours, they had a credit note back to me and I just dumped those plants. It was no problem. So here the actual product isn't up to scratch, but they're working with a company who they, they've got good intentions and they're helping them out. They're just doing the credit note really quick, the good and fair returns policy it says on the left, and, and that's sorted and they're happy with it. Alternatively, one company who repeatedly sent poor quality plants we're very apologet apologetic and it's turned around completely now. There's no issue. So here there's a, a company that have been uh, open to stop problem solving. They've looked into problems and they've worked together to solve it. So this is another example of, of goodwill trust and um, working with good faith. So the other type of trust was competence trust and having the ability to perform. So some people, when we asked about what makes a supplier trustworthy, they talked about in-depth plant knowledge, clear guidance for staff on how to handle plants, clear, uncomplicated answers, supplying what you need, and good range of good quality stock. So they're delivering what you want. The nurseries, we would expect to be pulling out anything that's showing any signs from a disease point of view before it even gets sent to us. So here, this person that we talked to, this interviewee, is talking about how um, it's about the quality of the product that arrives, not necessarily what's going on behind the scenes. You know, if there is a disease or a pest or disease in, in their supplier, they're saying if it comes to me and it's looking good, I'm fine with that. Secondly, I would have liked to go to nurseries and see the plants for myself, but you just put in the order by email or phone or whatever, and they will bring the plants to the site. So here, this person is saying, OK, maybe I, my, maybe I am interested a little bit in the process behind the scenes, but actually it's so convenient and it's so great that the, the, um, the performance is good enough that I'm, I'm, I'm happy with them and that's what I trust in them. So how do this, these types of trust impact biosecurity and particular, particularly Xylella? So if you just go back and a reminder of these, the links between these different risks, trusts and controls, there's these different types of risks. You hope that you have these trusts in the people that you're working with, but if those trusts, those that trust isn't there, there are these process uh, or output controls, these actions you can take to try and manage the risks. OK, so here I'm just going to go through um, different uh, scenarios where there is trust or not, and when you might have a uh, or a pest situation and potential uh, potential outcomes from it. So you see um, in both these cases, you'd say different types of risk. Is there trust? Yes or no. And when there isn't trust in both of these, that's where the controls come. Then I've picked where whether there is a pest that's easily detectable. So how do these how do these types of trust interact with whether a pest is easily detectable in a system or not? Now, this is really important, of course, with xylella because we know it can be really, really hard to detect. There's a latent period and some of the symptoms aren't necessarily completely indicative of xylella itself. So this is important for xylella. And then this leads to a set of potential potential outcomes or relative biosecurity risks. 
And here I've labelled them as yellow, red and green, depending on whether they're serious or not. Um, it's a bit busy, this slide. I'm not going to go through it all. What I'm going to do is I'm going to simplify it a bit by just looking at xylella as an example. So I'm saying, is the pest easily detectable? I'm going to say no for xylella in these cases and see how that goes. So I'm going to go just from top to bottom. So from the first one, is there goodwill trust in a relationship between a supplier and a customer? Yes. Uh, xylella is not detectable in this case both the supplier and the customer have trouble detecting xylella. So the pest goes undetected throughout the system. So here, the good intentions of doing your best um, isn't enough in this case. Alternatively, where there isn't goodwill trust, you can try this behavioural control. So that's all about scrutiny of supplier system. So maybe you don't have the trust, so you go and you, you scrutinise the system. So you look at documentation, you look at cleanliness, you do checks, you look at their training, you talk to their staff. So in this case, it's still hard to detect Xylella, but actually as a customer, they're really pushing for a general increase in the biosecurity ability of the supplier. So that's what's being pushed by doing these checks. So there, it could still be bad and Zylella could get through, but the fact that you're increasing, that means it's ranked as yellow. It's not quite as bad. So moving over to performance risk uh, and the actual ability to perform. Do you trust? Is there competence trust? Do you trust they're competent in doing these things? In here, it's again, Zylella is hard to detect, but you've got this high level of trust in their biosecurity ability. So that, again, should mean a bit of a lower risk. You trust that they have the ability to do and deliver good quality um, uh, or plants that are pest and disease free. So that's a good thing. Alternatively, where there's no competence trust, you can rely on these output controls, which is all about measuring the quality of the output and then feeding back. But of course, Xylella is really hard to detect again, so they can't detect it, but maybe you trying to measure the output of the, uh, the quality control and feedback, you don't detect it either. But, Pathogen is not going to easily appear on quality control on quality control, and therefore that sort of fails and the pest might go on through to, to further customers. So here I'm just I've just so this work is trying to trying to illustrate how these interactions of these different types of trust and how people might be able to control for these different types of trust and risk alongside how whether a pest is detectable or not can lead to quite different biosecurity outcomes. So in conclusion. We were looking at the, the spread of uh, the human pathways of Xylella spread and we're looking at how the trust in suppliers plays a key role in decision making and impacting the, the plant movements. This is the first kind of study where we're trying to unpack what trust actually means. It's quite complex uh, across the live plant trade and then the potential impacts on biosecurity and our potential biosecurity risk outcomes depend on trust and also how that interplays with the likelihood of detection. And then thinking forward to what can we do about this while well, thinking about how risk communication should be tailored to uh, audiences depending on these trust driven behaviours. What are you relying on in order to think what kind of trust are you relying on with your relationships with suppliers? Um, and is there a way that risk communication can, can uh, influence different types of uh, behaviours from people? So finally, this work wasn't just done by um, purely by ourselves at Forest Research. We had lots of conversations with other colleagues across the Bridget project, and here's all the partners there. And so thanks to them, and also thanks to the funders, UKRI, uh, BBSRC, then there was DEFRA and the Scottish Government. Thanks very much.